So it's been a fitting that we are at the gateway to the south at the State Office of Rural Health in Cordell on this important day, National Rural Health Day. And uh, we've been here before. It's a great, great facility and venue. So we uh, really appreciate uh, you having us. And a uh, great venue for yesterday's state meeting, uh, which was well attended. And I thought really one of the best meetings, uh, the whole audience was everybody, all the stakeholders were engaged and great discussion. Um, and then we broke out into our sessions with GCTE and the trauma medical directors. And there was a lot, at least I was at the TMB, and there was a discussion there. I heard for the other group as well. So, uh, so uh, kudos to everyone for participating. Um, with that being said, we're fortunate to have Dr. <laughs> Dean Burke, former Senator Dean Burke, with us today to open the meeting for us. Dr. Burke is now the Chief Medical Officer for the Department of Community Health. He was always a great supporter of ours in the Senate and well respected by uh, health and policymakers. And uh, I've, I've, I've called on him many times over the years uh, when he was in the Senate. And uh, he was always very helpful and, and, and just really had a good grasp of what was going on and uh, a lot of wisdom. So, uh, Dr. Burke, um, please come forward. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to South Georgia. Is this mic working? Do I need this one? I uh, always enjoy the excuse to uh, get out of Atlanta, and you all provided me one today, so thank you for that. Um, uh, the other thing that I try to remind my colleagues is they call Cordell, South Georgia, but I just drove two hours north to get here from Bainbridge. So uh, <laughs> they really don't know what South Georgia is. Uh, but anyway, uh, again, uh, welcome for, to our State Office of Rural Health. Uh, uh, as uh, Dr. Ashley said, I'm the uh, Chief Medical Officer at uh, Department of Community Health, which is an a new role. I I'll, I'll, will have been there two years in, in January, and that, it's amazing how time flies. Uh, I'll report directly to the commissioner, and uh, basically uh, my role is to uh, meddle in all his business from a clinical standpoint, to, to give him advice. If he pushes this lever, what's going to happen uh, on the ground in, in, in patient care delivery, which uh, when I was across the street from the agency at the Capitol uh, with my legislative hat. Um, I was the appropriations chair over health care and, and had the Department of Community Health budget. And, you know, we worked very closely together, but uh, it was a sometimes contentious uh, situation because, you know, I wanted them to move faster on some things. and didn't understand why they were doing other things. And uh, after 10 years of, of messing with it, I said, well, I'm just have to go over there uh, and uh, see what, what I can do in person rather than complaining about it. So uh, I've enjoyed my time there. Uh, I tell people it's the best job in the world that you get to spend $20 billion of other people's money every year. I mean, you know, that's a pretty good, good gig. And for those of you that don't know, the Department of Community Health is, uh, the agency that's uh, uh, been designated by CMS to manage the, the state's Medicaid program, which is the, the largest portion of our, our budget, and uh, also the state health benefit point, uh, program, the, the employee state employee health plan is uh, under our purview, as well as the facilities regulation, and, and uh, which is the survey and entity for uh, nursing homes and hospitals, licensing as well. And uh, we also do uh, health planning, which is the got the the bad acronym CON attached to it, which has been in the news and been very uh, contentious over the last several years. Uh, so we, we have a lot on our plate. Um, there's a procurement of the CMOs, the care management organizations that, that actually manage the low-income Medicaid program in Georgia, uh, which covers, um, I think last count was about 1.4 million uh, Georgians. So that procurement's 
soon to be announced, I hope, before the end of the year, which uh, don't tell anybody because that's still undercover because it's a procurement, but we, we should hopefully hear something soon. Uh, the couple of points I wanted to, to make besides the, the, the welcome is, uh, number one, just a big thank you for, for this organization. Um, uh, over my time in, in the legislature, uh, obviously being a physician and being in a, a, a rural county in Decatur County in South Georgia, um, the, the inadequate access to, to, to trauma services is, is, is a, a huge issue. And I think Georgia nationally has been recognized as make, making huge progress there. And now we're one of the places people come to see how we're doing it rather than us trying to figure it out. And that comes from great leadership of this organization. And I want to thank you all for all the, the time and effort that you put, put into keeping Georgians healthy when they're uh, going about their, their daily lives. And, you know, this is just a, uh, amazing to me, the progress we've made. Um, the, the map that, that you've used very, very well for, for uh, showing where the, the gaps are, you know, has closed in a lot. There's still some work to do, especially in, in rural Georgia to, to improve those uh, level threes and level fours. And, and I know that we're, that's been part of the discussion since you've been here is trying to identify what more can be done. So uh, consider us a partner. Uh, I know the governor has proclaimed today Rural Health Day, and we have a, a proclamation that, that uh, I'm not going to read for two reasons. One, it's long, and two, because the type's so small I can't read it. Uh, but uh, again, just know that, that we uh, recognize the, the, the work that the State Office of Rural Health, which is one of, one of my areas of, of supervision, is, is this office, and I'm proud of the the small but mighty team that they have here that, that they cover the state because, you know, 80% of our state is rural uh, and it's uh, a, a big, big, big state and a lot of counties, a lot of facilities that fall under that rural designation. And uh, we have been trying to uh, improve our processes to, to make this office one of the best rural uh, uh, health offices in, in the country. So uh, that's a, a big job. And Nita, as some of you know, was uh, promoted to the director's role, uh, and uh, I've given her the uh, responsibility of getting to know uh, all these far-flung rural parts of Georgia. So she, if you call her and she's not in her office, then that's what she's supposed to be doing, is being out on the road and meeting with people and finding out what's happening in your neck of the woods. Um, and, you know, we do, because they are grant experts, they have a lot of grants that are even not rural. So she's she's not just limited to, to rural, but that is her, her primary focus. So again, welcome to, to Cordell. Uh, anything that we can do to make your stay here today better, let us know. And uh, anything that I can do to uh, help you uh, as you go about your your continuation of the great work you're doing to improve outcomes uh, in, in Georgia uh, is uh, so important. So I, again, thank you all for that. So thank you, Dr. Ashley, for having me. Thank you, Dr. Burke. I'd be glad to answer technical questions. If anybody has any, I'll be here a couple hours. That's good. Make a note of that if you can get Dr. Burke over in the corner and ask him some tough questions. Um, Okay, at this time, I'll turn it back over to Liz. Thank you for having me. Sorry, that went down a lot easier than it went up this morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. And I, I'll echo uh, Dr. Burke's comments with Nita. So pleased that you're, you've accepted this role, Nita. Thank you. And it's been a great partnership between our two entities. So we look forward to a lot more work to come. And um, we're going to uh, switch gears for just a moment here. And again, since it's National Rural Health Day, we want to do a little uh, connect of purpose. Um, and so we've invited Emily Brown. If Emily, if you can come up to the uh, podium. Uh, Emily is the director of EMS and trauma at uh, South Georgia Medical Center, who goes by SGMC Health now. So Emily would like to share a little story with you all. Good morning. 
Thank you very much for, for having us here and <clears throat> allowing us to present this um, case study this morning. Um, rural, rural trauma care is very important to me. I started my nursing career in a very small critical access hospital um, about 15 minutes up the road from, from where Dr. Burke said he drove from this morning. Um, and we, we started with two stretchers and there was a curtain between that stretcher. And, and I worked my first trauma there and it was very impactful for me. And, and you know, 20 plus years ago, you don't know what you don't know. And, and I've been very fortunate to be able to, to learn a lot about trauma care. And now you realize, you know, what the barriers are, were then and still are in, in rural trauma care. And I think it's very important and I hope that I'm able to highlight some barriers even in this case, um, regardless of the outcome that we faced. Um, Lowndes County would not be considered necessarily rural. We have a lot of uh, a, a high population there in Lowndes County of about 120,000 people. Um, but where we sit it is, is considered rural. And so I, I hope I'm able to highlight some barriers that we had this day with this case study um, and, and really kind of connect the dots for how important trauma care is, organized trauma care, whether you're a trauma center or not in these areas, how important it is for organized trauma care to take place here and, and how impactful that will be on the outcomes of your patients. I don't know if I have a, there you go. So just a little background about um, SGMC Health and our, and our trauma. We are a, a state designated level three trauma center and we received that designation in June of 2023. Um, so we see about 17, a little over 1,700 activations a year, and about 112 of those activations are what we consider our level one or our highest trauma activation. Our immediate coverage area there covers about 1,589 square miles, and that's what we cover with just our EMS services. So that spans over about four counties, and that's a lot of square miles to cover um, with, with, your, with your ambulances. And those total four counties have a total population of about 160,000 with about 120 of those residing in Lowndes County. Um, you can see kind of where that little red pin there is. That's Lowndes County. And the star right there beside it is where this um, trauma occurred um, that I'm gonna talk about in this case study. Um, the, the other two marks there actually mark our nearest level one trauma centers in Georgia, which is Macon and then over in Savannah. And if you actually use that mileage, average mileage, um, and include the, the out-of-state trauma center that is um, about as close to us down in Gainesville, we still sit about an average of 120 miles from the nearest level one trauma center. So that is significant whenever you receive a, a trauma patient that's been severely injured. Um, so the morning of, of this accident, this was a Saturday and it happened um, October 24th, 2023, which was a little over a year ago. Um, I specifically remember the weather this morning being um, very foggy, um, and I went back and actually looked at the at, at the actual weather report from that morning, um, and your visibility was very low, but for anybody that's familiar with your flight criteria, the ceiling that morning at the time of this accident was only 700 feet, and it stayed below 1,000 feet until 1130 that morning, which means that we would never have gotten a helicopter to, to even be able to land at our hospital um, to, to come get this patient. This accident didn't happen in Brooks County, and Brooks County sits between Lowndes and Thomas County, um, but this accident actually occurred about 18 miles from SGMC in Valdosta, and he was probably about 38 miles from Thomasville, which is why the decision was made to bring him to Valdosta. Um, this was an accident that occurred at an intersection, and, and this patient was um, traveling with his one of his family members. Um, went through the intersection and they were actually T-boned by a full-size truck carrying a lot of heavy equipment and all of the impact happened on the passenger side of the vehicle. It was actually um, so much intrusion that the front passenger uh, seat uh, folded almost in half. Um, the patient was extricated before EMS arrival and the accident happened about 7.30. Um, so when that EMS department got there, I think the fire department had already extricated the patient. Um, so we received a, a level one trauma activation from the scene, from this EMS service. This was not our EMS service. It was a, a neighboring service at the time. Um, and they told us at 8.15 that morning they were preparing to leave the scene, called our, our hospital report. At this time, we think they had already been on scene about 45 minutes with this patient. Um, and then at 8.16, we paged out our level one trauma activation. That is, that's our process at our hospital. Um, it took them probably about another 30 minutes uh, to 30 to 40 minutes for them to actually get him to our, our hospital. And while he was en route, there was no significant treatments done other than an IV 
um, and they did have him immobilized and had him on a monitor. Um, he did have an IV, did not receive any IV fluids, um, and really his, his abnormal vital sign of his heart rate 145 was super concerning to us along with the impact, so we did, we did make that a level one trauma alert. When he arrived at our hospital at almost nine o'clock, his GCS was 14. He was able to follow some commands, but he was confused. Um, and you can see there that his blood pressure was um, 154 over 107, but his heart rate had already started to drop. And he was compensating respiratory wise with a respiratory rate of 30. <clears throat> we did have our team at the bedside assembled um, because we had such an advance notice from the scene, which we, we love that. So we were able to get a lot of stuff done in that first 15 or 20 minutes of him being there. Chest and pelvis x-rays, the chest x-ray um, showed a lot of broken ribs on the right side, which again was the side of impact. He had displaced rib fractures from ribs four through eight, and then ribs nine through 12 were um, non-displaced rib fractures with a pneumothorax. Um, we did begin our mass transfusion protocol um, within about 10 minutes of him being there. And starting that mass transfusion protocol is gonna be very significant um, to the outcome of this patient. Uh, our surgeon arrived, um, but it, uh, within about 15 minutes of his arrival, he did go into cardiac arrest. We inserted bilateral chest tubes, he was intubated, and we worked the code where he went into VTAC four times and was defibrillated, and we did obtain ROSC at 931. Um, and we were able to stabilize him enough to get him to CT scan at about 947. Once in the scanner, um, there were multiple injuries that were noted on his CT scans. He had many uh, liver lacerations, a very severe spleen laceration, a right kidney laceration, a right hemothorax, and then he had a retroperitoneal hematoma on the right side. Um, all of that was, was actively hemorrhaging. Um, we did take him, we did assemble our own um, critical care transport team at this time. We started working on that. We do not have that dedicated to our hospital, so it's something that on a case-by-case -case basis we have to put together. And we do have quite a few critical care paramedics, um, but this uh, paramedics, unless they have post-licensure um, skill set, cannot transfuse blood, so we have to get RNs and, and respiratory therapists to come. Um, the patient did return from the CT scanner to the trauma bay where we placed an additional right-sided chest tube, which further helps that um, right hemopneumothorax. And then from 11 to 1240, there were multiple attempts made um, to find transport for this patient. We were not ready to be able to put him in the back of our ambulance. We felt like he was not stable enough for a two hour ground transport. Um, and we were still unable to get a helicopter there, even though we had acceptance from an out-of-state trauma center um, to accept the patient, we just could not find a way to get him there. Um, so this, this patient, I'll tell you, is a member of the public safety uh, family and so for anybody that's ever taken care of anybody in that family you know that when one is sick or injured they are all sick or injured and when they find out that they're they are there they are all coming so by this point um I was not there but I received a phone call that said hey we've still been unable to get this patient transferred out and um for my staff that that knows me my my famous you know they expect me to say well I need to get my britches on and come that way. So that's what I said, and that's what I did. And when I got there, there were multiple um, multiple people from, from the sheriff's office um, where, where he worked and from the EMS service, you know, where um, that, that is in that same county. And so everybody's working on transport for this patient. And we worked on that for a long time, and we were continuously giving him blood products in our trauma bay. Um, and and Eventually, at about 1240, we were unable to um, wait any longer, and he was taken to our operating room um, for some damage control resuscitation surgery um, where he had an open laparotomy. Um, we did have to remove his spleen, and then there was extensive abdominal packing that was completed. Uh, at the end of the surgery, he did become a little bit more hemodynamically stable, um, and we did make the decision at that time that we would be able to move him to our ICU while we tried to continue to work on transport. Um, but one of the barriers that we had there was our ICU staff was not comfortable um, trans doing the MTP. Um, and so we, we made the decision because we already had acceptance, just take him back to our emergency room, even though that's not our normal process for post-op, but because of proximity to the helipad and just because our ER staff was more comfortable with our protocols, we took him back to our emergency room. By the time we got back to the emergency room with him, um, our, the helicopter at the level one trauma center that had accepted him said that they were on the way. Um, and so we were going to await for that helicopter. 
It was probably only about 10 minutes after they said that, that they called us back and said they had tried to lift off and the fog had not burned off enough for them to come. And so during this same amount of time, um, we're, we're calling all over the state. Um, many of his, his professional counterparts are calling all over the state trying to find an IFR rated helicopter, um, trying to find the, they, they said eventually that the Georgia State Patrol helicopter might would come, but um, it, it, we would have to put qualified staff in that helicopter and that's, that's a whole different, different ball game. So we're, we're still, we're going back and forth this entire time, you know, between do we put him in our ambulance where we don't think he's gonna have a good outcome or do we, we continue to wait on a helicopter. Um, the helicopter ended up um, uh, canceling on us almost three times. And so uh, there were some very um, direct conversations between us and that service of, you know, we, we need an answer. We need to know if you can come or, or what we have to do um, because I think we packed our ambulance at least two times to take him. And the doctor, the ER physician finally said, and we all, you, you have to take him. And I said, I said, well, I don't, I don't know that this is gonna go well. And he said, but you just got it, you gotta do it. And so I kind of walked off and said, Lord, I'll take him if you want me to, but I don't feel good about this. And I called the helicopter service back one more time and said, if we can meet you at the airport with him, could you come with the IFR helicopter and, and we'll get him to the airport because our helipad is not IFR rated. And they agreed to do that. And then 10 minutes later, they called me back and said they had to turn around because they had mechanical issues. So, so I had all of the, the ambulance packed and I, I think I not only um, do I hope I'm impactful with this story, but I thought I was impactful with their service that day when I said, uh, we're coming. And I'd like to speak to y'all when I get there. And they called me back and said, we found our, our second bird is back and, um, and we're gonna come. And so they did finally come on that, on that third time. So total, um, total time from OR recovery to the time of transfer was three hours. Again, they canceled on us three different times. There were multiple calls to other flight agencies. Um, everybody was working on this. Um, the patient was eventually transferred from our hospital, but he was transferred eight and a half hours after his arrival, which obviously is not ideal. Um, prior to transfer, we actually transfused 67 units of blood product for this patient, which was about 16,570 cc's of product. We, we replaced his blood volume almost three times before he left from us. And I would like to tell you that the outcome here is, despite all of the barriers and just because of some perseverance from, from not only the, the staff at our hospital, but also all of the people that came, you know, that cared about him and had these different resources. There was a lot of networking going on. Um, he was able, uh, underwent multiple surgeries at the level one trauma center he went to. He was actually discharged there after about 45 days and went back to his home hospital, which is um, Fairview Hospital where he's from. And then on April the 16th, he was actually able to return to work. Um, so there is some, some significance um, to this, and, and I think Terry Cobb um, is familiar with this patient, and so I think he'd like to say a few things about him. Thank you, Emily, and, and we appreciate uh, the outstanding work that y'all did that day. So uh, I'm going to ask uh, Captain Chris Bracewell and, and his family to join us. I've known Chris for probably 29 years. Stole a truck one time from me. Yeah. Yeah, I stole his truck one day from the post office. So uh, that is AR-15 and it had stepped in the post office. So I run down the street and jumped in it and took off. So uh, we've got a we've got a storied history together that uh, brings a lot of laughs. So welcome, Chris. And and I just asked them to come up here and join us today while we recognize the, the excellent work that was done that day. And uh, you know, we thank God for the the miracle that happened that day. And so, well, you know, I've told the story a bunch of times and I try to be strong every time, but it all started with a cup of coffee, believe it or not. I remember my brother was in Thomasville and we was at a friend's house. Yeah, I don't want to bore y'all, but I'm just going to tell you from the beginning. And uh, he brought us three black cups of coffee. I said, I don't drink black coffee. I drink Circle K coffee. My brother looked at me and said, well, we'll find you a Circle K. So we was looking for a Circle K when we had our rig. So I can blame this all on a cup of coffee, really. 
But, you know, things happened for whatever reason. My life was changed. Uh, I can't tell y'all how much support I've had. It just really means a lot for the people that had something to do with my getting better to hear it from them. You know, I wanted to go to Valdosta. Terry made arrangements to go to Valdosta. I met everybody that had anything to do. I wanted to. I'd like to go to Shands. Uh, I haven't made that trip yet. There was a lot of good people that helped get me here. God's the main person. I thought I could be stronger than I am, but, I'm, you know, it is what it is. But, you know, things I, things turned around my whole life. I had a very supportive boss. Terry was very supportive to me. Uh, you know, everybody that had anything to do with me, I very much appreciate. I just didn't realize what all we went through until she told us about the helicopters. I knew there was a... You know, a, a, a a little bit of a delay, but I didn't realize there was that much delay. But God's blessing, I'm still here. God had me in the right place, the right time, the right people, the right situation. That's what I'm here now. I'll tell everybody that. And it's just amazing to me that what between God and medical can be done. Uh, you know, I'm not supposed to be here. Everybody says, you're a walking miracle. I don't look at it that way. But things happen for a reason. I haven't figured out why it happened to me, but it happened. And we all dealt with it together. And I really appreciate everything that everybody's done for me. Thank you all. Basket says, um Presented to SGMC Health Level 3 Trauma Center in honor of National Rural Health Day and recognition of your commitment to joining the Georgia trauma system and providing exceptional care to injured patients, November 21st, 2024. We're so glad you all joined the system. I'm sure he is too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Look here, I was a lot to a lot of people. I'll never be able to repay. Well, before I leave, I do want to tell you everything that these people, if it wasn't them, wouldn't be here. And I know that. And I want to tell everybody how much it not only to me, other people that could just use this record. This all was in place because of y'all. And I really appreciate that. Thank you. I think the, the rest of the meeting, it'll, it'll all be downhill. <laughs> But, you know, really, we, we work hard and we it, it gets sort of mundane sometimes and we wonder if we're making a difference. I mean, this was really, you know, an, an injection of uh, energy for me. Uh, and uh, I'm glad that he had the, the, the guts and the strength to come and share because uh, basically, uh, can you all hear me now? I think they turned my mic on. Hello? Can you hear me now? Is it off? There's a door open for a certain amount. I don't see the top of it. No, it's a door. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me now? So, um... <laughs> But I'm just glad he was willing to share his story. And, uh, you know, really, uh, you have the greatest job in the world. And it doesn't get any better than that. So give yourself a pat on the back. And if you're having a bad day or tired of sending emails and doing stuff, just remember this day. I mean, that's what I do. I, my patients come back to see me in the ICU or they're walking in. And uh, it it really means a lot to the staff. It means a lot to us to get to see them. So, um, so I'm really appreciative that he was willing to do that. I think we got more out of it than you did. Really.